Although lots of business people, politicians, students, commentators, and others have been seduced into believing that the sole responsibility of a business is to make a profit, this view is false. Now, it's important not to forget that businesses do have a responsibility to make a profit. Like, um, it, it's important not to pretend that businesses are charities and to evaluate businesses with exactly the same standards with which we would view charities. But to think that this is the sole responsibility is to ignore the important social context in which business takes place and the obligations that arise out of that context. So the, uh, the stakeholder theory of R. Edward Freeman does a really nice job of accommodating both of those important things that businesses do. They make a profit and they have lots of other social responsibilities. And over the next two lectures, I'm going to be exploring this stakeholder theory. Now, in this lecture, I'm going to be talking about the criticisms that Freeman has of traditional managerial capitalism as it is conceived. And in the next lecture, I'm going to be talking about his stakeholder theory alternative. So let's get into it. Now, it's important to note that Freeman is not trying to destroy capitalism. He's not trying to destroy the modern corporation. Uh, what he's trying to do is, is transform it. And here's a quotation about that. He says, I do not seek the demise of the modern corporation, either intellectually or in fact. Rather, I seek its transformation. So what is he trying to transform? Well, he's trying to criticize something called managerial capitalism. So he states managerial capitalism as follows. In return for controlling the firm, management vigorously pursues the interests of stockholders. So the idea here is that corporate executives should be trying to pursue the interests of stockholders, and that this is the sole responsibility that they have, or that this responsibility trumps all other responsibilities to other stakeholders, such as employees, uh, suppliers, citizens in the surrounding community, etc. Freeman offers two different lines of argumentation against managerial capitalism. The first line of argumentation has to do with the law. And basically, what Freeman says is, like, we need to be asking this question, in whose interests should businesses be governed? And you might think that the only interest that matters is the interest of the stockholder, but he says that the law says otherwise, that other interests should be taken into account as well when businesses are thinking about how they're going to be governed and what decisions they're going to make. And to make this case based on the law, Freeman points to different decisions that have happened or different laws that have been passed over the last hundred years. And he says that these laws really clearly demonstrate that other interests must be taken into account. Uh, one thing he points to is Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which tells us that the, uh, the discrimination is not allowed in employment. And actually, just this year, in 2020, when I'm recording this lecture, uh, the United States Supreme Court extended Title VII protections to sexual orientation as well. So that's pretty cool. Another law is the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act. And what both of those things do is they say that the pursuit of profit is constrained by, you know, a need to keep water safe and air, you know, clean. And so... Basically, the, the upshot is that if we're asking the question, you know, in whose interests are businesses going to, uh, should businesses be governed, the law tells us that it's not simply the interests of the shareholders. So that's the first line of argumentation. The second line of argumentation is based on economics. And what Friedman does is he takes a look at an argument, an economic argument for managerial capitalism, and then he debunks it. So the argument goes like this. Premise one. Corporate executives ought to perform the action that creates the most net well-being out of all the options in their option set. Premise 2. Seeking to maximize the wealth of shareholders is the action that creates the most net well-being for everyone out of all the options in a corporate executive's option set. Conclusion. Therefore, corporate executives should seek to maximize the wealth of shareholders. The argument is valid. So what that means is that if premise one and premise two are true, then C, the conclusion, is true as well. The question is, are premise one and premise two true? So I want to be as generous as possible. And in order to be as generous as possible, I'm just going to grant, for the sake of argument, that premise one is true. My focus is going to be on premise two. So let's talk about it. So premise two is false. And Freeman gives three different arguments to show that premise two is false. And I'm going to examine those arguments in the order in which he presents them. So the first one has to do with something called the negative externality. Now, doing business is costly. When I am engaged in a business that pollutes, for example, what I'm doing is I am using up resources that exist out in the natural world. And if I have to pay the full cost of using those resources, 
that eats into my profits. So it's in my best interest for somebody else to pay those costs. So if somebody else gets sick from my pollution, then they have to pay their own health care costs or some insurance company has to pay their own health care costs instead of me. That's great for me. If, so, if I'm using you know, water and then there is less water for other people to use and other animals to use, and they bear the costs of that loss of water rather than me having to compensate for them, that's also great for me. Or if the quality of the water that, that they're getting rather than just the quantity of it is, is lower, that's also, and, and they bear that cost rather than me, that's also great for me, right? And so what we can see is that the, because of the existence of negative externalities, um, seeking to maximize the wealth of shareholders is not going to always be the action that creates the most net well-being for everyone, for everyone out of all the options in the corporate executive's option set. It maximizes my own you know, wealth, but that doesn't mean that it's going to maximize the most net well-being for everyone. So that was Freeman's first line of criticism against premise two. Now, his second one has to do with situations where there's a third party paying the cost of a good. So if I produce screwdrivers and you want to buy a screwdriver, you come to me and the price of it is some kind of a function of how much you're willing to pay and how much I'm willing to sell it for. So, so far, so good. And the price can be affected by other uh, competitors who offer alternative screwdrivers for different prices. But suppose that there's a third party who pays the cost of the screwdriver. Now, you're going to be not, be, you're not going to be as worried about the cost of the screwdriver. And when you have a health insurance company that pays most of the cost of a drug, the price of a drug doesn't matter as much to you as if it would if you were paying the full price. And what this can do is it can result in wildly inflated drug prices because the pharmaceutical companies are no longer competing directly for your dollar. They're no longer competing directly against somebody else and trying to say, let's see if we can offer the best deal possible so that we can get the customers rather than some other company and the customers, right? So they're no longer competing among themselves directly for the, the business of customers. That gets mediated by a third party, leads to wildly inflated drug prices. And so that's a, and that and that's that that's not good. So that's sort of a second way that um, if we look back at premise two, seeking to maximize the wealth of shareholders is not the action that creates the most net well-being for everyone out of all the options in a corporate executive's option set. So Freeman's final criticism against managerial capitalism has to do with monopolies. So if I'm a cable provider and there's another cable provider down the street, I need to offer a product that is at least as good as the product offered by that other capable provider in order to get your business. Because if it's not, either in price or in quality, it'll just go elsewhere. But what if I'm the only game in town? If there's no other, other like cable provider in town, then all I need to do is offer you a product that is slightly better than not having any cable at all. So I can have the worst customer support and I can have the highest prices as long as it's slightly, as long as like that resulting package that I'm offering you in terms of the customer support and the price is better than, like makes you better off than you would be if you didn't have any cable at all, I'm good to go. So monopolies can be incredibly lucrative for businesses, but they're really bad for customers. And so looking back at premise two, seeking to maximize the wealth of shareholders is the action that creates the most net well-being for everyone out of all the options in the corporate executive option set. There are lots of cases where seeking a monopoly would be the thing that maximizes the wealth of shareholders, but it certainly doesn't create the most net well-being for everyone out of all the options in the corporate executive's option set. All right, so it seems clear at this point that premise two is false, and managerial capitalism, as, as it's uh, traditionally conceived, must be reformed. So in the next uh, lecture, I'm going to be talking about Freeman's solution for how to reform managerial capitalism in favor of a stakeholder model rather than a shareholder model. All right, thanks.